Good afternoon. I'm Mary Lou Bielek, and I've had the great privilege and responsibility to work alongside Judge Marcy Khan to be the co-planner of today's program. When we started to work on developing a program about how discourse on hot topics happens or is shut down or goes viral, we realized that we couldn't explore this subject without understanding the role that media, in particular electronic media, plays both in our understanding of events and in the limits and opportunities it, opportunities it presents in our ability to handle the events that play out more locally in our law schools and at our workplaces. This lunch, lunch program titled The Role of Media in Hot Speech, Reporting, Distorting, Covering, and Uncovering, is designed to give us some insights into the forces at play and deciding what stories get covered at what speed and from what sources. Joining us today in person and on the room uh, for the next hour to shed light on how our news becomes news. Our first, um, first our moderator, Anil Kahan, who will facilitate the conversation. Um, Anil is a professor of law at Drexel University and also holds affiliated appointments at Yale and Penn. Um, he serves on Committee A on Academic Freedom and Tenure of the AAUP, the American Association of University Professors. Um, and uh, before he went to law school, he worked for the cable news network, PBS's McNeil Lehrer News Hour. Um, and so he comes with uh, work on the ground in this field as well. I encourage you to look at the bios for all of our participants to see all the other things that they've done. On Zoom, hi, Victoria. We have Victoria Baranetsky. Victoria is the general counsel at the Center for Investigative Reporting. She there counsels reporters on news gathering, libel, privacy, subpoenas, and other newsroom matters. Um, she was a First Amendment fellow at the New York Times, a fellow at the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, and is currently a fellow at the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia. Um, and here in the room with us, Najib Amini, who uh, Victoria works with, who's a producer for Reveal, which is the newsletter for the Center for Investigative Reporting. He previously worked as an editor of a news aggregation startup called Flipboard. He also worked for Newsday in the Indianapolis Star, and he is the host and producer of an independent podcast called Some Noise, which is based out of Oakland, California. Um, I look forward to hearing uh, what they have to tell us about how it is that the stories that reach us reach us and how the difficulties on the ground and filtering what happens on the ground through to us um, produce the news that we read and hear. Anil. Great. Thank you so much, Mary Lou. Um, and thanks, Victoria, for joining us from afar and G for being here. Um, so th so the, the morning sessions have explored some of the dynamics within college and university campuses uh, with respect to controversial speech. Right here, we're going to talk about um, how journalists and media organizations have been engaging reporting on what's happening on campuses themselves. But before we get into the coverage of campuses, um, I think it would be useful to briefly hear from both of you your thoughts more broadly about how journalists and news organizations have been covering the war. Right, we're not getting into the merits of the war. Right, but but. Um, you know, how the various forces that are operating on colleges and university campuses, and as we'll talk about this afternoon, in the workplace, the legal workplace, right? Those are forces that are also operating in newsrooms, right? And, and of course, as, as Dean Diller noted this morning, right, the discourse about these issues on campus is, is not happening in a vacuum, um, right? It's informed and shaped by the information environment that we all live in. Um, Sometimes it's the kinds of conversations that are taking place are echoing or reproducing the discourse that's happening outside of campus. Um, sometimes they're building upon and amplifying or trying to deepen what's taking place off campus. Sometimes they're reactions to, uh, right, or trying to sort of uh, intervene in a corrective kind of way to what's happening in public discourse, right? Sometimes they're fill, trying to fill in gaps that are missing or perceived to be missing. Sometimes there are, um, outside groups that are expressly seeking to make campuses arenas or theaters for the kinds of 
um, contestations that are taking place off campus, right? So I think it's it's useful to at least briefly think about the broader media and information landscape um, to, to situate how these campus and workplace controversies are taking place, right? So, so with that sort of as a prelude, how would each of you um, uh, assess or evaluate how journalists and news organizations have been doing in covering the war, right? I mean, you, this is an open-ended question. You can take it in whatever direction you want, right? But just sort of, just I think it'll set up a little bit of context for then talking about some of the other things we want to talk about. So Victoria, maybe we'll start with you. Sure, can everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, well, thanks so much for having me here today. Um, you know, I, I, in my position as general counsel, you know, I'm often looking at, you know, how the story our newsroom is telling is falling within the parameters so that we don't get served with a complaint. Um, and the truth is in making that kind of assessment, um, you're often looking at, you know, what is what is the story that's being told in front of you and how many sources were, you know, spoken to? Um, how did the sources know that information? Um, what else is, you know, missing between the cracks of the narrative? Um, and in any story, you know, like the one involving the war, um, there are a lot of, you know, aspects of what are shaping it. Um, but one thing that I hope that we'll get to a little bit more today is really, you know, it's it's also a reflection of where the news industry is today. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen, you know, there's been a massive reckoning uh, with the news industry uh, this past year. Um, just this past year, I would say almost every major uh, Stone publication has had layoffs. And in that, um, you know, layoffs, if not entire closures of the news department, like um, Vice and BuzzFeed. And, you know, what you look at in how a story is shaped today, it really has a lot to do with the business of journalism um, and how it's trying to survive in this market. Um, and, you know, I, I know on the media did a fantastic um you know, discussion most, I think just a few weeks ago about the war and the coverage around it, saying that there were certain things that were disproportionate and what kind of words were used. Um, but I think what that, what that episode missed a bit was just how it's a reflection of what these news organizations are going through. And, you know, something we'll talk a little bit more today about is, you know, the ability for um, newsrooms like the Center for Investigative Reporting to tell a story a little bit different because it's a nonprofit investigative newsroom. And so we're not beholden to the 24 hour news cycle in quite the same way that other institutions um, really are pressed for that kind of commercial feedback. Um, and by having those allowances, you can have a story, um, have a little bit more breath, have a little bit more time um, you know, they always say that the news is really the first account of history. Um, but, you know, it's it's a different when you have, you know, a deadline of, you know, two hours to write a story versus, you know, several weeks. And I think Najib will respond a little bit more to that today. But I think that really is a key to answering, you know, why we're telling the kind of stories that we're telling in the media. Um, and it's based on on the business, which is, you know, kind of a, a simple but important and revealing um, narrative to go into. So I'll leave it there and turn it over to my colleague, Najib. Uh, thank you for having me. And first of all, if I say anything during this presentation, please don't sue me. That's a joke. I'm sure that's not the first time that's been said in the room like this. I apologize. Uh, and I'm happy, like, I think there's going to be only so much that can be said during this panel, but happy to have side conversations, or I guess you got to call them sidebars after this. That's 0 for 2. Um, but I think, I think, uh, I think what Vicky's getting at is like, I think it's just like understanding the context of like the room that you're operating in. So there's one, and it's like depending on how macro or micro you want to get. But I think to answer, go to your, you know, specific question, like, how is the news media doing? I don't think I'm, you know, uh, going out of bounds by saying I think this is a moment where the institution of American journalism is failing to meet the moment. Um, I think there have been moments in the past, in recent history, you can look at, you know, notably, and for me growing up, it was the post 9/11 era. Uh, specifically, you could even look at, you know, the buildup to the Iraq War, 
um, where there's a lot of kind of mistakes that are happening. And naturally, anytime you have a conflict such as this, or you're in a kind of a, a wartime scenario, you're going to enter the fog of war. There's going to be a flurry of information that's just going to be happening where you as the reporter are trying to do, if you're doing your job well, you're trying to make all this make sense in an, as earnest of a way as possible. Are you going to make mistakes? Yes. But when there's systemic mistake after mistake after mistake, what do I mean by mistakes? I mean, they could be things along the lines of when is the passive voice used versus the active voice? Uh, what is who is the, the the centering of a story? Um, who are the sources that are you know being uh, either uh, centered or anchored for the reporting of an investigation? Um, are there multiple sources? Is there a way to verify that? Are there reporters on the ground who are verifying this, or is this all coming from a you know arguably a primary source that might be related to a government or a military? Like if. And even the sense of like, are certain myths, like I remember in J school, I had, um, for us, it was this New Orleans uh, case study, um, Hurricane Katrina. Um, uh, if my dean is watching this, I'm sure he'd be proud. But it was this concept of like, oh, not like, you know, there were bodies in this freezer and like the the amount, like just like, you know, just the, the aftermath of Katrina was horrible and this and this and this and this. And I think it was looking into the Superdome and it was this question, like, did the reporter actually open the freezer or did he just go by someone's account? Because if you actually opened the freezer and walked in, that wasn't the case at all. And so if you're just going based on kind of, you know, secondhand or thirdhand, thirdhand accounts, you're not actually getting at the truth of the matter or like the sense of like what is actually happening. So to answer your original question, like how is, you know, the institution of American journalism doing? It's not doing well. But then to go to like to Vicky's point, where do where does like a, you know, in, in my role, it's like it's understanding, well, do you want to chase the pack? Are you, you know, a daily news uh, outlet where you have to kind of like feed the beast and you need to get a story, two stories, three stories out? Am I a 24 seven news cycle where you're just like, okay, we need to fill the air. We need these talking points or at least we're uh, Vicky. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're kind of in this outlier space where we put out a weekly investigative oh. radio show. That's no easy feat. But what that also means is like, it, we have the, we have the luxury of time to sort of like get, you know, get our ducks in a row, fact check, proof everything, you know, um, uh, double check, triple check, get additional sources to, before we put out a story, like we want to make sure it's as solid as possible. And so I think in this fog of war, mind you, it creates a scenario where if you're in a different shop or you're, you know, in a different economic constraint or uh, situation, you're going, you're, the, your organization is going to respond to it in a little bit differently than say, if we're at a nonprofit and we're kind of operating in, in our kind of um, uh, weather climate, so to speak. So, so um, as my friends in journalism always point out to me and remind me, right, to speak of the media is is painting sometimes with a very broad brush. So I just want to pick up on what, something you said, Najib, about um, journalism failing to meet the moment. I mean, are there distinctions you would draw between different categories? And I'm thinking, you know, print versus um, electronic media or the United States. We, we sort of frame the question in terms of the United States, but international news organizations. And also then where are the examples of things that have been done well, um, where, where, wh what are the, right, that, that, that we can point to the failures, but are there things that you would point to as positive aspects of that story? I, I might be biased in this and forgive me, but, and I know like time is a luxury, it's a privilege and we only have so much time in the day, but the slower the story, the better. Um, there was a story by a producer, uh, I think Dana Balut that, um, she looks at the journalists that have been uh, killed covering the, the conflict in Gaza right now. It's not. It's on This American Life. Highly recommend it. Um, there, uh, there's a the New Yorker has been publishing certain essays uh, from varying perspectives that really get into like you know the crux and the nuance and the complication of these stories. Are you gonna find? And again, I'm biased here, but are you gonna find that caliber of nuance, complication, in a three minute roundtable? Uh, that's followed up by another commercial break, that's followed up by another commercial break. You might, it might be like a, a, you know, lightning might strike and you might catch it, but it's just like, it's just the way the format of say something like a television, you know, like a broadcast news segment or even a cable news segment is designed. You can't have the complexity of that conversation as opposed to 
some of the longer form longer form pieces of journalism, even if it's like an all things considered segment. I, and it's not to say just because something is long, it's automatically good. I've just seen, like, I had, I've, I've had to since like turn off cable news and even TV news because it's just, it just, it, it's not telling me anything. Like, sit with yourself. If you're, if you are, pri if you were, like, if anyone in this room is primarily getting their information, regardless of if it's CNN, Fox News, NBC, local NBC, like. There's there's a sense of if you're, if you're getting localized news or so, you know you just want to get a quick like catch up of the day, but are you genuinely learning anything? Are you being challenged in any way? Are you confronting your worldview in any way? And like just think about the time that you're spending, because like if you're not, I would just caution, I would, I would challenge or you know encourage you. Like there's so much journalism out there. To your point, you can't just paint everything with a broad brush, but there are also in in light of you know this failure at, in this particular moment, there are countless and countless journalists and a lot of these organizations that are trying to do right by this moment as well. It's just unfortunate it's this overshadowing. Victoria, is there anything you, else you wanted to add on this topic? I think the one thing I'll caveat is that, you know, when I was in journalism school, you know, you picked a lane, you know, were you a radio person? Were you going to do broadcast? Were you going to do print? And at that time, it was the first year that Columbia Journalism School offered um, online training. And I, I think that the truth is that all these mediums offer themselves for lending, for, you know, discovering some kind of information, right? And that's what television is really great for. It's for quick news broadcasts, something that is needs to be delivered um, with celerity. Um, but I think Najib has a great point. And, you know, one of the things about the news industry, it, it is speed. It's always a question of speed. Um, you know, what kind of information needs to be translated at what pace? Um, and when you are talking about complex issues involving elections, involving wars, you know, um, you maybe need to take a beat and uh, think about it in a way that is helped by the medium. Um, and I, I will say that, you know, I, I, I think that newspapers and, and uh, broadcast and radio, you're always going to get it wrong. No journalist is ever going to get it right. Ben Smith wrote this wonderful, um, you know, self-criticism about, an, uh, you know, some reporting he had done um, on the war in some of the war in Eastern Europe um, at the beginning of his career, and you know, kind of explained all the things he had gotten wrong the first time, um, because you can't get it right, even if you're writing about it in print. Um, but I think, like Najib says, maybe there are certain aspects of the medium to slow you down or to consider it in different ways, as well as the newsroom and the structure of it itself. Um, Straight. So I think these are themes that we'll come back to, but let's turn to the way in which the media is engaging some of these controversies on campuses. Because Najib, you worked on a segment for Reveal back in October, mid-October, I believe, um, that was looking at student protests and counter protests at Columbia University, um, which took place after the university had issued uh, statements about um, the conflict, right? And I commend this report to all of you. It's linked in the materials for this program. It's a really terrific um, story. Um, but for the benefit of folks who haven't had occasion to um, either hear it or read the transcript, could you just tell us a little bit sort of in a nutshell sort of about what um, the, the the crux of the story was? Sure, thank you for the kind words. Um, just out of curiosity, like by, show, by a quick show of hands, who knows someone has someone either you know ch a child grandchild or you know relative that is in college facing kind of what's what you know this this clash on campus type of atmosphere is it just a few or okay i thought it, 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 i'm sure it's hard to escape but if you know someone especially you're probably like at thanksgiving or you know family gatherings it's like what's it like on campus um kind of had that same attitude but one of the things that i was noticing uh was who was being centered in a lot of this coverage? And oftentimes it was this notion of uh, administration is doing this and you know students are revolting or it, it was kind of this like, you know, one side versus this other side. Um, and it was like really centering on like, you know, the Ivies are responding to this, you know, th this way, or look at the congressional testimony. 
um, that hearing in particular was kind of like what kind of set the parameter of this story. One key group that was missing in this entire narrative, the actual students who were organizing, who were protesting, who were, you know, putting their bodies on the line at some point. Um, and the, even the students who might have felt uncomfortable because of those students who were protesting or organizing. What is it like from their perspective? And recognizing that, like, you know, the college campus, I mean, I, I imagine a lot of people here probably went to one at one point, um, can be like a microcosm. And it does, in a way, it's like a mirror of the, the, the places and spaces that we operate either professionally or socially. Um, and to kind of like from a storytelling device, it was like, oh, like you can talk about the bigger thing by just focusing on this one setting and try and get into like the nuance and the crevices and all that, but really centering on like from the student perspective. So to answer your question, what is what was the story? If you didn't get a chance to listen to, please listen to it. The, the name of the podcast is Reveal. Um, but it was basically following these students over the course of a semester uh, and looking at not just why they were organizing, but trying to peel back and like look at like the currents that were, you know, um, very much churning underneath. Those currents being, you know, from the academic point of view, from the broader national point of view, but also from this this idea of this like donor revolt, um, which is, you know, something that goes in line with this conversation about free speech. And even this kind of, you know, what what certain academics have called this right wing push to also, you know, challenge what it means to, you know, the liberal academic institution and this attempt. You, you see it in places like Florida and things of the sort. So the story kind of weaves in and out and goes through. It's not just students and the administration. It's kind of trying to go layer and then one layer deeper and then one layer deeper and then bring it back to the students who are wrestling with all this. So you told us a little bit about what drew you to the story. I think for, for those of us who don't work in news organizations, it can be a little bit opaque how it comes about. So what does the process look like? You know, you sort of come up with this idea for what you think you want to explore within your organization. I think every different, uh, every, every news organization is going to be different. And I think for us, I think one thing that was universal, specifically in the coverage after October 7th, was I believe was the the attack on the Al-Shifa hospital complex in terms of the fog of war, in terms of, well, who fired the rocket? Was it this group? Was it this group? Um, do we have, you know, reporters on the ground? How do you verify that? And, you know, by the time you're trying to verify and it's like, you know, taking a week, two weeks, there's been X, Y, Z that has happened afterwards. And now it's created this kind of, you know, this chilling effect on how do newsrooms cover this without, to Vicky's point, you know, making the mistake or having to be like, oh, we can't, like, it, it creates this kind of like, well, we want to slow down how we cover this because we don't want to have, we don't, and naturally, I mean, it's a correct stance, like you don't want to rush and you know, put out a story that might be inaccurate. You don't want to lose. You want to, you, the worst thing you can do. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of bad things you can do, but like you, one of the bad things that you can do is like lose the trust of your audience. Um, but for newsrooms, like I'm sure there are many people in this room that have varying opinions or you know perspectives, and they they have you know uh, they come from different backgrounds. But in a newsroom, you want that. That's healthy. That's diversity. You don't want everyone agreeing. But if you're not having a conversation about it what are you doing? And so for us as a newsroom, uh, there was a point in time where we were looking at, you know, at least on the radio show component, what were the uh, upcoming shows and what were the stories that we were covering? And, you know, I think there was a couple of staffers where, like, you know, raising up the conversation to be like, I, you know, like, we should probably cover this. It's, you know, the biggest news story in the world right now. And so it's hard for us because of our, you know, our state of the state where we can't do a quick news hit because we're not staffed like a CNN. We're not staffed like an NPR where we can just throw bodies at a story and make it happen. So for us, it's also a sense of investment in time. Is Vicky available to do the, the, the fact checking? Like there's so many like, you know, um, uh, micro decisions that feed into, well, can we go ahead and move forward with this story? But ultimately there was, you know, enough general consensus within the newsroom to move forward and that's how essentially the hour came about, where it wasn't just an hour on what's been happening at Columbia, but it was also a conversation between, um, I believe it was a mother who lost her son, 
and uh, as well as a, a father who lost their child as well in conversation. And I believe the second part of that story was looking at the U.S.'s role in terms of arms sales and things of the sort. Victoria, how would that kind of picture look um, different in different kinds of new news organizations, right? Sort of just to give us a little bit of some co context. I mean, Reveal is, of course, a particular kind of news organization, right, with a nonprofit, independent um, mission, right? So how, how, give us a little bit of a broader picture, if you can. Sure. I mean, I think what Najib hit on is, you know, the main crux of it, which is the staffing is different. Um, you know, so you look at a place like Reuters, for example, right? They had many journalists on the ground, um, folks that are there to give their firsthand account of the story. And that's what they're going to tell a narrative around. And their focus in many ways is about the timeline, about breaking it, seeing a firsthand, you know, witness or account and telling that narrative. And in our position, in our newsroom, um, we obviously, you know, don't have that kind of staffing. Um, it's a much smaller news organization. And the point of it in many ways is to fill in an area of, you know, this news landscape to have a different purpose, have a different goal. Um, and Najib is, you know, kind of trying to showcase, I think, you know, some of the conversation that was happening internally of how do we tell this story the right way? Um, and part of that is leveraging the strength of what your newsroom can handle. Um, and, you know, Najib can go a little further into, you know, that story took, you know, a matter of, you know, weeks, not just a matter of days or hours. Um, and so that's, I would say, the main difference of how it would look, which is, you know, people on the ground reporting things immediately and feeding it out into the news stream versus, you know, a collective thought process of, what kind of story are we trying to tell here? Whose voice hasn't been shown? Um, internally at Reveal, we have you know various guidelines in the same way that the Associated Press does and the Times does, et cetera. Um, but it, you know, I think we have a unique set of guidelines that you know make us question you know what vocabulary are we using when we're writing about immigration? Um, whose perspective is the story told from? Who are the sources that we're going to? Um, and, you know, what else is missing from this narrative? And, you know, I'll add, you know, we can speak to this a little bit more in a moment, but um, this, you know, is very much a product of today. Our newsroom is, is you know, a 50-year-old news institution. It was founded in the 70s by some New York Times reporters that went out uh, to the West Coast to have, you know, a, a good old time and founded this great nonprofit to do just investigative news. Um, and it's unique, but today in today's landscape, it's filling a very particular role, um, which is, you know, a complete collapse of investigative um, branches of newsrooms, as well as local news reporting. Um, you know, and, and we can talk about this more, but examples like the Baltimore Sun, for example, that used to have you know, something like, you know, I think 14 to 20 um, uh, bureaus across the country, you know, now is, you know, a staff of uh, 60 in the newsroom. Um, and so when you have these diminished papers and newsrooms around the country, um, nonprofits have really begun to filter in to fill this chasm for local news reporting and for stories that really otherwise would not have airspace and airtime. Um, and so the, the largest the largest difference of how it would be handled is really, um, you know, just staffing around a specific mission to tell a specific story that hasn't been filled into um, the gap of the media landscape. I mean, the, the dynamics you're describing undoubtedly must exacerbate a phenomenon that I noticed during the brief time I worked in journalism in a very different moment, which is that even between an organization like CNN and an organization like the PBS NewsHour, there were dramatic differences in coverage choices, right? So, you know, when I was at CNN, there was a, you know, I was actively discouraged to spend my time focusing on international stories because the ratings uh, would go down when the particular shows I was working for would, um, when they would do international coverage, right? So, so that leads to a question about sort of this you know, in, in the kind of um, fiscal environment that news organizations are facing today, um, you know, and that kind of dynamic was not present at the news hour, right? But what about metrics like that? I mean, if not that, maybe other things that sort of affect how you are thinking about coverage. 
right? It's sort of, it may be playing out in a certain way in a larger news organization, but I imagine it must also be a factor, even at a, maybe in different ways, but more intensely in a small organization, right? Depending on the kind of contingencies of funding and things like that, that might put, um, you know, the organization. Vicky, I'll take the um, the the broader context. So you take, like, if you want to take the, like, the nonprofit uh, angle, but like, I think, I mean, it, this can go from like a sense of uh, sorry. I hope I wasn't too boomy on the mic. Um, it can go from a sense of like uh, a show like All Things Considered has a clock, and you are you are strict to that clock. There's no way to change it. You, you the parameters, literally the stories that you can tell. You have like you know a minute to tell the first uh, the first story. You have you know uh, maybe ten minutes to tell the second story, and you have like two minutes to tell the other. That is simply a time constraint. But then if you're doing a, a um, uh, if you're working within the context of say something like a CNN, a cable news network, you're also operating in a, in a similar clock where you have your A block, your B block, your C block, where you need to cut that conversation off because you need uh, the, you need the advertising money to keep the operation running. Um, but then how does that kind of translate to other organizations? Look at uh, companies like say Puck or Semaphore or some of these newer organizations uh, that are offshoots of places like uh, the New York Times, VC money. And so they're getting a lot of amazing talent, people that have made them made names for themselves at institutions like the New York Times, the Washington Post, so on and so forth. But they are running on, a, they're essentially on a runway where they need to prove some kind of economic viability. Uh, and so they are, you know, the, that first year, second year, third year, they're taking chances. They're, you know, um, making swings. Um, and it looks like a viable operation, but we've seen like, look at the advent of Vice or Buzzfeed or, you know, countless other digital operations that were VC backed where initially you're like, this is a, the Buzzfeed news team won a Pulitzer. Like this was a legitimate operation. And then literally like a couple years later, it just shuttered. And so it creates this like sense of, um, what's the word, uh, tumult or I guess, uh, it, like it, it, there's so much anxiety, not like from a reporter point of view, like where's a shop that I can A, work at, but B, who are the shops that are also willing to take on the chance or the risk of doing an investigation, for example, or investing in the resources in a place like Gaza right now, or for those stories, because it also, it just comes down to some degree, like the numbers, there's a separate, you know, conversation about like, if you, I think it was in the, uh, I forget which, there was a story that just came out the other day, other day about how modern news outlets are not taking a chance when it comes to investigative stories. They often back down. And I think like this is where we as an organization, like the Center for Investigative Reporting, Mother Jones, like we have the benefit of having Vicky on our staff because we have the support of counsel to where if we do get this pressure to be like, we wanna go forward and we have the receipts and we like, we've done the reporting like we have the backing, we have like the ability to have an in-house counsel to support that kind of reporting. Do you have the same level of support if you're on a VC-backed operation where you need to be able to, you know, prove economic viability in a year and a half? That might not be a, a you know, a return on an investment, so to speak. So I think Vicky, if you want to kind of speak more to the like the the alternative landscape compared to say like the yeah. Yeah, absolutely, Najib. I mean, I think that what's an interesting way to pivot these two against each other, um, or maybe three really is, you know, the the experiment of the aughts, which was, you know, these online publications, and it was VC backed, and everybody thought, well, ads are going to make it, you know, and Ezra Klein just gave like an interview exactly about this subject that, you know, there was a bet, there was a bet that eventually they would be the modern Facebook, Twitter's, Etc. of the of the modern day and would be able to financially back themselves with likes. And so stories were essentially going to be looked at as clickbait. And to a certain extent, that is still, you know, the the driving parameter at a lot of various news organizations. I mean, we don't do this, but reporters at many main establishments um, are, you know, clocked at how many followers do you have? How many likes are you, your story getting? They have very experienced um, technologists on staff that are enumerating all of this um, metrics. Um, and that's not to say though, to Anil's point that at a nonprofit newsroom, we don't have our own various forms of metrics, but it's obviously a different financial model. 
And in the nonprofit sector, you know, essentially you're beholden to major funders and foundations and not in your reporting, obviously, because that's expressly said, I've seen the contracts and, you know, you're getting donations to survive and tell a story um, that has impact. That's kind of the crucial word. And so impact is really um, assessed through various methods, but it's, you know, what awards you're getting, what kind of um, uh, citations the story has received. And so it's looking at a different set of analytics than simply how many people liked this story. You know, how many eyeballs did it get? And um, that is, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the secret sauce that makes a nonprofit news outlet's narrative a little bit different. So there are other places like the Marshall Project that's now, you know, telling these fantastic stories about the criminal justice system or the markup that's speaking about um, the technology sector. Um, that's another nonprofit news outlet. We've for a long time had The Intercept as well that did national security stories, broke out the Snowden story. Um, and those outlets were able to tell those narratives because they had different uh, financial backing. But, um, you know, and again, we can talk about this a bit more. Obviously, um, since, uh, you know, the breakdown of local news, there has been a massive increase in the number of nonprofit news outlets that exist. And, um, you know, someone once told me that it's, well, it's not a zero sum game. There's enough, you know, money to fund all these places, but I beg to differ. It, you know, it is a zero sum game. Uh, you know, The Intercept had laid layoffs earlier this year, a very well established um, nonprofit newsroom called the Center for Public Integrity um, announced just a few weeks ago that it was on the brink of collapse and bankruptcy. Um, and, you know, these other newsrooms are all struggling to try to get funding to be able to tell the stories that aren't being driven by advertising and clicks. And I think that's really the major difference is that, um, you know, the, the incentive behind these nonprofit news outlets makes for a different story, but um, they themselves now are also struggling because they need to find um, a way to finance their narratives um, in competition against other nonprofit news outlets. And I'll just say one quick thing, which is um, I think what the news has seen, and, and that's what Puck and Semaphore are now trying to do differently from their, their grandfathers. You know, uh, Semaphore is run by Ben Smith, who used to be at BuzzFeed. And, um, you know, they're now doing um, event, uh, you know, different kind of events and subscribers. They're trying to diversify um, their bank accounts, you know, and try to get different streams of money and nonprofits as well, like Mother Jones have been known to succeed um, because they have different kind of um, funding models that's not just from major foundations and major donors. Um, and that's a very hard thing to do when you are pressed for um, resources already and you don't have an established newsroom to really put the resources on building a business. Um, so, you know, I think that's kind of explaining a little bit as to why there are these varied stories out there. So let's connect this to the substance of coverage a little bit. And, you know, some of the, there's a little bit of, um, probably not too much of airing of grievances as a university faculty member, but, you know, I, like you talk to sort of, of many university faculty about how higher education in particular is covered, right? Particularly if you're not at an elite um, institution, right? There's a certain, you know, our report card would be a certain amount of sensationalism, lack of nuance, right? Disproportionate focus on uh, elite institutions, right? I mean, the total undergraduate enrollment in the United States is about 20 million people. Um, around 70,000 students are in the Ivy League institutions, um, uh, maybe about 7,000 at Harvard. Um, uh, disproportionate focus on a handful of high profile incidents, right? So, you know, you look at the, the cafeteria wars at Oberlin, and that is the picture sometimes you get about what is happening in higher education writ large, right? Um, sometimes uh, the, the um, uh, information about higher education is coming from very well-funded, politically motivated efforts to delegitimize academia. Right, there are some very well, and 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 do you know questions are sometimes arise of what are journalists um, approaching those actors and the information sources that they're getting critically enough 
uh, or are they taking what's happening at face value or in a credulous matter? So, you know, all of this sometimes adds up to, um, for, for, for at least some of us who are, you know, working in higher education sort of sense that um, there's not just an exaggerated sense of crisis when one reads or sees about accounts, but, but a distorted sense of the challenges that actually are taking place, right? As Professor Schrecker mentioned um, in the session earlier, sort of just giving a little context for the adjunctification um, and you know just the broader kinds of structural forces that are actually in quite eerily in parallel to some of what both of you have talked about in journalism as well, right? So, so anyway, those criticisms in the main have been directed at um, you know large news organizations like hypothetically, and for example, speaking the New York Times. Right, um, but so tell us, give us a sense of just you know your, uh, how you see this. I mean, is there a significant difference in the substance of how these this particular range of issues, which of course is of particular interest in this program, are being covered by different kinds of news organizations? Are you calling me out for why I covered Columbia? I am calling nobody out. No, no, that's fair. It's a totally <laughs> fair question. I love all the questions. Um, I think. I mean, I I'll take my, like. Let's use me as an example. The other day, I am a graduate of the Stony Brook University, you know, SUNY school, uh, undergrad, and I think yesterday they had a couple of students go into the ad uh, the admin building and kind of hold their um, their demonstration. Is that going to arise to the C the you know the headline coverage, the TV coverage, the five thousand word magazine opus? No. Is it going to make the New York Times? Probably not. And I think this is kind of where this is me playing the role of media critic um, and like butchering my chances of working at a place like the New York Times. But um, it's like the reality is like, again, context, like we're people and our experiences shape us. And if I'm in a newsroom surrounded by other people, that a lot of them happen to go to Ivy's, their interest is going to be about the experiences that they've lived through. And so if you, I, I haven't done the analytical research, I could you know, throw a hypothesis to say that if you look at the staff of a place like the local you know, New York City paper, um, how many of those people came from Ivy's? How many people have certain backgrounds that speak to this disparity that you're talking about where why is there so much attention on Stanford, Yale, um, Columbia? I mean, I guess like uh, what's the other one? Uh, Cornell? That was, that was a joke. I don't know if anyone went to Cornell. Yeah, o for three, o for three. Um, but like, I think it, I think that that disparity that you're discussing is actually like it's so true. And I think one of the the, the uh, we we touched on this in the reporting of our story was. There's also this undercurrent, which is like this donor movement uh, where donors are in a, in a position right now, because if you look at the higher education model, where in the same way that you could argue nonprofits are in this vulnerable space as well, because of how much they've shifted solely to be reliable on, you know, whether it's foundations or donors, that kind of thing. But for higher education, there's a lot more like reliance perhaps on the donor class. And what that means is when the donor class is no longer, you know, content with the handling of certain things on campus, they now have the ability to flex their muscle to kind of say, well, we don't like this and we're going to use the power of the purse to kind of express how much we do, we dislike this. And I think, you know, I spoke to one expert in the story who kind of, you know, indicated it's, it's, it's this donor revolt. So to, to that point, it's not just, you know, this, you know, um, ivory tower, you know, palace intrigue. There's definitely going to be that human component. Um, but I think it's also to like how much are people questioning this 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 uh this 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 movement where the people who donate to a lot of these institutions are essentially flexing their muscle in a way that perhaps is challenging what the academic institution has has become over the last couple of decades. Vicky, I'm sorry if I ate up your time. No, not at all. Um, I think what you're talking about here is, you know, the question of objectivity. And I think every reporter, you know, um, who went to 
you know, or was trained or went to a journalism school or, you know, is, grew up in this industry understands that, you know, that's considered to be, um, you know, the, 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 the absolute ideal of what you want to aspire to. And, you know, that being said, you know, that's from like a Walter Cronkite era of thinking of this idea that, you know, a person can come in without any perspective or life experience or history and tell a narrative um, without impact of their own perspective. And, you know, in the past 20 years, there's been a reckoning with that question of objectivity and um, considering it even being outmoded for uh, the current news structure. And there's been, you know, kind of actually a a release, a a reprieve and, um, and, and I, you know, even um, uh, praise for people who, you know, call out that they're coming from a different place that can see the story through a specific lens. And I think that's why, you know, a newsroom like ours really focuses on who you are talking to to tell the story um, and what their perspective is coming into this and acknowledging that. Um, and, you know, not just telling the narrative by, okay, we heard this side of the story, now we're through that side of the story, um, but really thinking about the angles, you know, but that being said, like Najib and, you know, you and Nil just highlighted, obviously, when you have an industry run by people who most of them went to Ivy League schools, you run the risk of leaning into, um, you know, a true lack of objectivity and telling a story just about Ivy League institutions. Um, I mean, I think it's actually a criticism of our structure overall. You know, why did those, um, you know, presidents from those schools get called into Congress and not someone from, you know, SUNY? Uh, you know, I, I think it's it's also a reflection of our society, um, not just the news industry, but it absolutely bears, um, you know, witness and criticism to, you know, what kinds of stories are being told and why. And, you know, some of it, again, is, you know, people think there is like a bait click to, you know, seeing the president of Harvard fall, you know, that that's going to get you, again, more, um, more clicks. But, uh, you know, I think that's why you have to have um, a question or a moment within your news telling, where you think about the perspective of the storyteller and the story itself. Yeah, and it seems there's an objectivity question. Um, there's also a story selection question. I mean, you know, the, I was talking to, to Dean Alexander earlier this morning um, when he, you know, he shared in the panel recounting the positive and constructive experience when they had a controversial speaker come to campus. And it seems like, you know, positive stories are not news sometimes, right? It's sort of like, the, they're almost like the non-events, right? So there's all, maybe it's also a little bit of a distortion in that direction. I mean, you could, this is like a endemic to journalism overall. Like, you, I mean, the Boeing stuff aside, like that's a, that in itself is very much, a, you know, a story, but you, you look, you look at the, like the quintessential example is like, you look at um, the, how many, day, have, like, do you hear about the, the, the story about when the airplane lands or do you hear about the story when like the airplane doesn't land? And how many times in this in the world are, are are airplanes landing in a given day? And so I think that's kind of you know the part of that I feel is like our the, the reptilian brain uh, and just who we all are as like individuals and people. And so I feel like there's pr- perhaps some of that component uh, uh, happening when it comes to those positive events. Yeah. Uh, Najib, I want to turn back to a specific issue that surfaced in your reveal. Um, story, right? One of the experts that you interviewed, Professor Nadia Abelhaj from uh, from Barnard, she described what she called a Palestine exception to freedom of speech on campus. Uh, So if you could just tell us a little bit about what she had to say about that um, and how she suggested that that idea has evolved over time on campus. I think that because you you, you alluded in your report to a, a report. Um, in your story to this report by um, an organization that sought to document this. Um, and then I'd be interested, well, well, why don't we just take that first, right? So to tell us a little bit about. So it's interesting. I, I feel like it's the best way to answer that question is to actually just like look at the arc that Professor Abu al-Hajj has gone through herself, um, where the Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian exception is this idea that um, there is this clamp down or there's, there's this coordinated effort to, to essentially, you know, 
provide this chilling effect or this cooling effect uh, in a professional setting and an academic setting to parties, individuals that might be raising the concern over Palestinian treatment uh, or a critique over the Israeli government over treatment of Palestinians. And so that's in the advent of websites such as Canary Mission. That's in the advent of you know uh, organized campaigns to challenge someone's tenure as they go up for it. That's in the sense of you know reaching out to prospective employers, things of the sort. And uh, what's interesting about Nadia Abu Al Haj and her story, and, and and some of this was in the story, but I think you know this has all been documented. Uh, she was, uh, I think, uh, pursuing her thesis. The, the 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 subject of her thesis was looking at anthropology in the realm of Israel and Palestine, and it was, you know, uh, something that peer reviewed. It was well reviewed. Uh, there was some, you know, cr critique or criticism, but then there was a flare up, and that flare up kind of took place when she was up for tenure, and it was kind of this, you know, this effort to be like. You had the New York Post covering this. You had a bunch of, you know, other publications. And it kind of became the spectacle that I think happened maybe in like the 90s or so. I might have my dates wrong, maybe early 2000s. But in having the conversation with her, she had this kind of like, I would be naive. And this is her in, in her, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but like her expressing that like, yeah, I'd be naive to think that I wouldn't get this backlash. Because it's kind of become the norm if you as an expert, as a scholar, or as, you know, uh, an activist or a protester, like there is now this kind of normalization that if I, as a, an activist, or if I, as an academic, or if I, as a professional, you know, decide to say X, Y, Z things about, you know, the Palestinian cause, I know it comes with the risk of, you know, potentially uh, I might be on a website. I might have certain job prospects be challenged. Um, and I think in the academic sense, the way that this plays out is, well, which clubs on campus are getting suspended? Um, and I think that's where like the crux of the story or like the, the reporting and our segment kind of like looks at, um, because you look at the treatment of, well, these groups can hold a protest. These 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 groups can't hold a protest, or these events can be hosted on campus. These events can't be hosted on campus. These rules get applied. These rules get changed. And so, in the uh, it's kind of I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, there's a detailed account of Professor Abelhaj's um, tenure process in the New Yorker. I think it must have been about a dozen years ago. Um, that if anyone's interested, they can take a look at. But you know the she was speaking about it in your story about um, the campus context. Um, but I think the interesting question that arises, right, because again, in the spirit that the same forces that are operating on campus are operating in a lot of different domains, right, is it, it, what's the picture in journalism and news organizations? Is there a similar or analogous kind of phenomenon that affects coverage? If I can ask you to rephrase the question. Sure. I mean, just like, you know, what about media discourse, right? I mean, if, if, I think there are some um, groups that would say there's a little bit of, you know, that there's, some, there's an analogous kind of Palestine exception to freedom of speech outside of campus, right? And that might be, take that might play out in different ways. And I think, you know, we might have disagreements about whether that's true. Right, but I just sort of wanted to sort of explore just initially as initial cut at it. Do you I, think that there's any similar analogous kind of phenomenon? I think if I'm understanding the question correctly, I, I all I can do is like point to an example. And like the example was around, I think it was the International Criminal Court's proceedings that happened a couple of months ago. And the coverage, at least on American media, and I'm just using the advent of broadcast television here. So it's not like, you know, indicative of the entire, you know, media. Um, but looking at, you know, of the different, again, looking at perhaps cable news, I can't speak definitively if this made the national broadcasts, but if you turned on the channel, if it was CNN, if it was MSNBC, if it was Fox News, if it was Newsmax or News Nation or whatever your, your choice is, um, you looked at the coverage of when it was, you know, one side of the ICC kind of presenting the case. And I, I distinctly remember there was little to, you know, little coverage at, at best. And that's a conservative estimate. And I believe like the next day when it was the Israeli response to the ICC claims, 
I believe there was a, a bit more coverage. But that I think is an example that can point to that I think might address yeah. your question. Yeah. yeah. We only have a few minutes left. Um, so I think maybe I'll just, uh, Victoria, maybe can you, th there's a broader and evolving legal landscape in which um, a lot of these issues are arising for news organizations. Um, maybe we could just sort of identify some of the particularly salient, salient legal issues that are arising that are sort of shaping the way in which news is reporting is taking place. Sure. Um, you know, I think that um, even more than, you know, the obviously there's uh, many things happening in the land of uh, First Amendment law and media law. But, um, you know, one of the greatest subjects, obviously, of our time is um, New York Times v. Sullivan and what is going to happen to that, you know, very established precedent. Um, and, you know, the question of essentially whether defamation um, what are the bounds of it and the protections around it? Um, and, you know, in addition to, you know, the, the changes in the law, which, you know, the basic tenet of that case is um, when the reporter tells a story, do they tell it with actual malice, which means um, a knowing disregard of the truth, i.e., did they know that something was wrong and did they report it incorrectly with that knowledge? Um, but getting to that, proving that, understanding that question has changed a lot in the last, um, you know, few in the last decade or so. Um, and now there are a lot more um, hurdles that reporters have to go through when they're dealing with these kinds of litigation um, to ensure, you know, with the court that this case should be dismissed um, because there is uh, no proof of actual malice. And so, uh, you know, there are these cases that were, you um, you know, anti-slap laws passed around the country, and there's an effort to get a federal anti-slap law passed. Um, but to to date, there is no such thing. And so we are all beholden to the anti-slap law of every state um, that everybody has. And, um, you know, from the Sarah Palin case, the New York Times was battling um, for the past few years and a uh, case that CIR had in California um, brought by a, uh, a cult that we were writing about. Um, it's been shown that now, you know, there are, there are tactics, procedural tactics that are taken in the courtroom to prolong that question of proving actual malice. So um, prior, you could just file a motion and show the court, hey, this is what we published. We didn't know anything more. Um, and, and that's enough. Um, but now discovery is allowed to be taken. Um, and I think what I want to highlight really is that um, we're living in a much more litigious environment, essentially. And I don't think that's a surprise to anyone, but the number of lawsuits that newsrooms are facing is, you know, an insurmountable number. And it's not just defamation. Um, you know, we're seeing a, a huge uptick of copyright cases as well. Um, and copyright cases being used um, by the subjects of stories where, you know, something was filmed that they owned, you know, the copyright to or um, tangentially claim they own the copyright to. And they can't bring a defamation claim saying that it's wrong, but they'll bring a copyright claim saying that you infringe them. Um, and so living in this very litigious environment, we're just a lot more cognizant um, of what kind of narrative, how it's being told. And I think, you know, one of the, uh, I, I just learned actually, there's a blog of, a, of newsrooms that are cataloging stories that were never told because editors are too afraid to publish the story. Um, and again, I think that's, you know, an interesting question about, you know, what gets highlighted in the press? What, what story gets told? Um, you know, why did, why was there coverage about Biden's age um, for so much of the last few weeks? Why did that get, why did that story get airtime over another story? Um, and in part, I think the answer to it is, uh, you know, the legal concerns that are arising today and these lawsuits are real and they can bring down entire institutions and you know the best possible example is the most recent um dominion case against fox news and you know there was a very interesting debate among the you know among media attorneys at that time about you know what to do with that case um you know obviously uh you know every media attorney is a staunch supporter of 
um, of uh, New York Times v. Sullivan. But, it, you know, what was shown there was that there was a clear uh, actual malice. And that's why the court, you know, made that suggestion and the case ended up sell settling. Um, and, you know, newsrooms, though, I think are in a lot more um, of a vigilant mindset than they have been um, in the past. Great. So this, you know, we really can only scratch the surface in this short conversation. We could have a whole day long program just on these issues, of course. Right. But this has been a really rich conversation. Um, uh, so thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.